Now presenting Gospel Restoration with Dempsey Williams from Montana Street Church of Christ and Richard Mendenhall of Chaparral Church of Christ. Welcome again to Gospel Restoration, where God is Lord. We are here to please God, to give Him all the glory. It's a beautiful thing to have Jesus as your Lord and Savior. We encourage you to study with us. The greatest vision on earth is getting into heaven, or the place where Jesus is preparing for us. Read John 14, verses 1 through 6. Today we have another lesson given by Brother Williams from the Montana Street Church of Christ. He's given us some great lessons on the history of the church. So follow along with them and search it out and, and let us know. Because we're here to encourage one another in the Lord. Now, Brother Williams, thank you. Yes. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Gospel Restoration. We're here again to have our weekly Bible class. And for this week, we're going to continue with some more history of the Lord's Church. This is a outline that has lots of pictures, lots of references to tell you what happened after the, from the first century on up unto this day as far as what happened to the church because we look into the world and we see all the different churches and we look into the Bible and the Bible says there's one faith, Ephesians chapter 4. So what happened? How is this possible that if the Bible says there's only one faith and we can look into the yellow pages and you got page after page after page, none of them preaching the same thing, none of them call the same name, same thing. So how did that take place? And that's why we're going to spend a little time this evening to complete our study in the history of the Lord's Church. From the beginning, the principle that this lesson is based upon, from the beginning, man has never remained faithful to God for any length of time. It's just a matter of time before man decides that he's going to improve on God's plan or God's plan is asking too much. So he decides that he's going to modify God's plan and make everything better. But we should realize that our thinking is not like God's thinking. Man's, God's thinking is high above man's thinking as heaven is above the earth. And this outline that I'm using here gives a lots of history that you won't find in the Bible. But they quote such people as Frederick Norwood, the development of modern Christianity, La Tourette, uh, the Churches of Our Father, Roland Banton, Scribners and Sons, Paul Hutchinson, and Winfred Garrison, just to name some of the historians where the information that's in these, these lessons comes from. Also, the, the Catholic Encyclopedia gives uh, the source of a lot of the history that you're going to find in this little book. It's the fifth lesson of a correspondence course, and if you would like a copy of it, just send me through email your your address and I'll send it to you free of charge. Now let's go back where and have a, a little review. Christ established his church on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, and they began to preach the gospel from that point on. And even during the New Testament times, you had a departure from God's word. Because the first departure that happened about 150 AD was that some of the bishops who were, who were appointed and ordained to serve in the churches, or in the church, each church had its own bishops, began to be exalted above the other bishops, so that you had like a chief shepherd, or a chief bishop, or a chief elder. And this was the first departure from God's word, because according to God's word, every congregation is to have a plurality of elders, and they each had equal power in the local congregation to enforce the doctrine of Christ. Not to write new laws. That was reserved for the 12 apostles. And they are the only ones that can write scriptures. But you have today something that is akin to scriptures, but it has come from uninspired men. Therefore, we are looking at the doctrines and commandments of men. Well, this happened when these exalted bishops took assumed authority. Now, if you look even in the New Testament, you'll see that this had taken place even before the New Testament was completed. 
Look at 3 John, the book of 3 John in verses 9, where Paul, or what John says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who love to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbid them that would, and cast them out of the church. So you can see here, you've already, this Diotrephes was an elder or bishop, and he was the one to determine who preached and who didn't preach and who was able to do what they did at that particular congregation. He had already assumed the authority as the chief elder in this particular congregation. And, and he would not allow Paul and the brethren who are attempting to teach New Testament Christianity and the doctrine of Christ would not allow them to come in and teach. Now, here's a question. If Paul were alive today, could he, would he be allowed at your church to preach? Or would there be a presiding elder, an archbishop, or a senior pastor who say, oh no, Paul, you can't preach here. I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the one that decides who preaches in this church. So you can see how the problem began. After a while, these exalted bishops got together, and in 325, they had the first uh, creed of doctrine and commandments of men was written. And a creed is simply a compilation of what we believe. Creed means I believe. So these men, these chief elders, these chief archbishops and the like got together and they began to legislate laws and write things. And, and this is where we got our first human creed in 325 AD and it's called the Nicene Creed. Now this was obviously a departure from God's word. The job of the elder is to enforce and to preach and to see that the doctrine of Christ presented in the Bible is presented pure and simple and plain to the people and that nothing is added and nothing is taken away. That's their job, not to come in and write new doctrines and, and interpret this and, and under, you know, make it plain according to them. And this is what has happened over the centuries. And these teachers have created a great stumbling block for Christians all down during the ages. This problem of exalted bishops exists even in the Church of Christ. Where we, we're trying to preach the pure, unadulterated gospel. We're trying to restore the church that Jesus Christ built. But even among the churches of Christ, there are congregations that don't have any elders at all, where the people will exalt the preacher to the position of elder when he is really not qualified to be an elder. So this is a problem that we have in small communities and small churches where they don't have the men that they can uh, ordain as elders. So they just assume that the, this assumption that the preacher is going to be like a stand in elder until we can get some. And that's a mistake. There are also circumstances in, in small congregations where there are no elders and they don't even have a preacher. So some one of the brethren will stand up and take responsibility and he'll show and he'll assume also the authority and, and be a leader and so that whatever he says goes and this is how these situations arise and this is what has happened and this is always an avenue and a departure from God's way if we want to stick with God's way we have to follow his his teaching and the elders job is to see that the church follows faithfully his teaching that is their job but when men are ordained because they're more popular or because they're through politics or influence, uh, these type of leaders cannot be a blessing to the church. And, and if you look at the history of the church, this is how the church was corrupted. They put men in there who were dishonest, evil, and uh, immoral men. And they were, they, because you could buy the job. You could buy, if you want to be a bishop, you want to be something important to you, you could just go in there with enough money and you could buy that position. This is what happened when the church state condition existed in Rome during the Dark Ages. So we can see that the qualifications are elder are very plain in the Bible. All you have to do is look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 7. You will see that the, the bishop has, first of all, has to be a man that wants to be a bishop. He has to desire to be a bishop. And he has to be a male, a man, married, his children in subjection. 
not greedy for filthy lucre, not given to wine, not a new convert. These conditions are very important. And anybody who is to serve as an elder has to meet these qualifications. But we have seen a departure from this in the Jewish religion it happened when Herod built the temple in Jerusalem. You could buy being the priest or high priest and the same thing happened in the Lord's church in the early days where the church was corrupted and you could buy whatever office that you wanted to be if you had enough money and had enough influence. But you can see that this led us men, the church, away from God's pattern, away from God's way. Because these men took it upon themselves to decide and interpret, well, the Bible means this and the Bible means that. And you don't have to do this and you don't have to do that. It's just like the case of, Cain, of Adam and Eve in the garden. God told Adam and told Eve both, don't eat of this forbidden tree because in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. So the devil came in and said, oh, no. God, didn't God say that you'll die for you to cheat? Well, I'm telling you, I'm here to tell you, you will not die. So he added one little word. And the same thing has happened in the New Testament. In the New Testament, in James, the Bible says that we know that a man is not saved by faith only. Not saved by faith only. So the devil comes and took the knot out of that case and say, oh, yeah, you can be saved by faith only. So you can see how the devil works. And this is how he deceives the whole world. Simply making little adjustments, little changes, take away here a little and take away there a little. And you come up with a completely different teaching. And we have to stay within the doctrine of Christ or else we do not have God. That's what it very plainly teaches in, in 3 John or in 1 John where it says that if we, if we don't abide in the doctrine of Christ, we have not God. But if we abide in the doctrine of Christ, we have both the Father and the Son. And another thing that has happened over time is the body of Christ is compared to a body. Christ is the head and we are the body. The members are the body of Christ. And in, first, in Colossians 1.18 it says, He is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning and the first form, firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence. So that means that Christ is the only head. He has always been the only head. He does not have a representative here on earth. There is not a head on earth and a head in heaven. That is a perversion of God's plain and simple word. Wait, the church is not a democracy. We can't, as the body of Christ, tell the head what we're going to do. We can't make the rules. We can't make the laws. We can't tell God, okay, Lord, this is what we're going to do. We can't vote and say, okay, now we're going to do this, Lord. No, that's not the way the church is set up. The church is, has a king, and he, there's no queen. It's just the king. He's an absolute monarch. And we go by what he says. If he says we can do it, we can do it. If he doesn't say we do it, we can do it. If we say we should do something, we should do it. If we say we shouldn't do something, we should not do it. It's as simple as that. And that's why you have to know your Bible. You have to study the Bible. You have to be aware of what God's will is. So that when somebody comes and preaches to you something else, you will recognize God's word as compared to the words and the doctrine and commandments of men. Now, this, this system where, where you have these exalted bishops meeting and making laws and writing, God, writing Bible, this created uh, many divisions. First, the first division was, of course, the Greek Orthodox Church. They split off from the Roman Catholic Church, among other things, because of instrumental music. And time and time, we're going to see that this issue of instrumental music keeps coming up and keeps cropping up and keeps creating divisions. But uh, in Europe, Many people were still aware of the New Testament teachings and the fundamental gospel teachings that, that Jesus and the apostles had, had left, and they were constantly attempting to restore and maintain the purity of the church.